The telecommunication industry has been bracing itself and anxiously awaiting to see if the FASB and ISB are going to move forward with their project on revenue recognition because the telecom industry will be one of the most significantly affected industries. While the boards did move forward, and in May of 2014, the new standard on revenue was issued, the standard replaces substantially all existing revenue guidance, including sector guidance. My name is Brian Schill, but I'm joined, with, uh, but joined by Valerie Boissou uh, from KPMG's Department of Professional Practice. We work on the revenue project here, and today we're going to talk about some of the impacts to the telecommunications industry. The core principle of the revenue standard is that an entity recognizes revenue to depict the transfer of promised goods or services to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services. Because you're listening to the podcast, I assume you have some familiarity with the five steps. I would just say let's pay special attention to steps two and four on identifying the performance obligations in the contract and allocating the transaction price to the performance obligations. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Valerie to talk about some of the issues. Thanks, Brian. So we have selected uh, five key topics to discuss today. Let's start with uh, allocation of transaction price. Can you give us some uh, color on that? Sure. Um, on this one, uh, it's worth noticing that the contingent revenue cap guidance is superseded, which is likely to result in an earlier revenue recognition in many arrangements. Consideration will now be allocated to each performance obligation based on their standalone selling price, and that is irrespective of whether an amount is contingent on future service being delivered. So, for instance, if you take a wireless contract where a service is bundled with a subsidized handset uh, that is delivered up front, um, the, the new guidance is likely to result in earlier uh, revenue recognition. It probably will be the same for um, a contract where free HBO is given to the customer for the first six months. Yeah, I would say definitely the allocation of the transaction price will be the kind of the key the key uh, change for the industry. How about the installation and setup fees? Can you talk uh, briefly about those? Sure. There is some specific guidance now on non-refundable upfront fee, and that guidance will apply to installation and, and setup fees. Revenue from those fees uh, will now be recognized upfront if the activities attached to the fee is a separate performance obligation, that is, if it is distinct from the other promises in the contract. If it is not a separate performance obligation, which we think should usually be the case for installation services, the fee will be considered an advance payment for goods and services. So the, the existing guidance in 922.605 of the codification, is that going to uh, exist anymore or will that be superseded? It will actually be superseded. So you're thinking of uh, the cable specific guidance that currently permits hookup revenue to be recognized up front to the extent of direct selling cost. Um, so that goes away. And from now, um, the cable and telecommunication companies altogether will be under the same accounting requirements. So when the non-refundable upfront fee is considered an advance payment, it will be recognized over the contract duration or on future contracts uh, as well. Um, that is only if it conveys a material right to the customer upon renewal. Um, so for instance, if the customer can renew the contract without paying the installation fee, that may indicate that uh, the contract conveys a material right. Okay, switching gears, how about the cost of obtaining and fulfilling the contract? Well, now incremental cost of obtaining a contract and cost of fulfilling a contract will be capitalized. Uh, for example, sales commission or new customer installation costs. Um, in terms of contract modifications, I just want to make sure I know what we're talking about here. So I have a cell phone plan. When I call the provider to change my plan, perhaps change the minutes or the number of texts, is that what we mean when we're talking about contract modifications? Yes, that is. Um, and uh, so for, for those situations and other situations as well, there now is a, a framework, very specific framework to deal with contract modifications. So depending 
under circumstances, some modifications will give rise to a catch-up effect and some other modifications will uh, result in a prospective impact. Um, as you well know, telecommunication companies experience many changes to their contracts, like um, additional services, lines, uh, incentives to customers, price reduction, free goods or services. Well, all of this um, will now have to be analyzed in order to figure out if those changes to the contract actually are contract modifications under the new guidance or rather should be accounted as variable consideration. Yeah, so that, that could be a, a challenging thing for companies to do. And Will they have to do this on a contract-by-contract contract basis, or can they do it on a, on a portfolio basis? Well, there is a, a practical expedient offered by the guidance to actually account for contracts or performance obligation on a, on a portfolio basis instead of an individual basis. Um, there is actually some conditions attached to this, so the contracts need to have similar characteristic, um, and so that the, the portfolio approach has uh, no materially different impact on the financial statements. However, the, the standard doesn't give much guidance on how to assess similar characteristics, so it is actually unclear how much effort will be required from entities in order to uh, document their portfolios. Yeah, but definitely some effort involved. So how much time do companies have to start thinking about this stuff? Well, for public business entities and certain non-profit entities, uh, the standard will apply for annual period and interim periods uh, after December 15, 2016. For all of our entities, um, application will be deferred by one year. Okay, so 2017 for public business entities exactly. and a one-year deferral for others. How about the transition approaches? Uh, there are three transition approaches available. Um, one is the full retrospective approach where all contracts get restated. There is a uh, retrospective using some practical expedience. And there is a third method which would, uh, which is called the cumulative effect at the date of adoption. And basically that one allows companies to report under the legacy guidance for the comparative periods and to only apply the standard from the year of adoption. So how about key takeaways? Well, for telecommunication companies, um, key takeaways are really that uh, revenue will be overall recognized earlier when costs will probably be recognized later. Um, the new guidance uh, involves much more estimates and judgments, and also uh, companies will have to disclose much more information. So overall, we expect a lot of impact on their IT systems and controls, um, also processes, and we encourage telecommunication companies to uh, start their implementation process as early as they can. Okay, well, thanks, Valerie, and thanks to you, the listener. Uh, for additional information, refer to KPMG's Financial Reporting Network website, including the latest on the Revenue Recognition page, which links to KPMG analysis of the new standard, defining issues, webcasts, and other podcasts.